and recording in progress. Apologies in advance. There is a very rambunctious two-year-old in this house. And at any moment, she can come bursting in through this door. My, my oldest has been deputized to babysit, but you just never know. Very welcome. Very welcome. And um, I would say, uh, Randy, get it started whenever you want. All right. Children, well, children wait. Welcome. And, and is Dodger also outside the door waiting to burst in? I am actually um, dog sitting at Katie Fong's house. So there are several pets. Ah, okay. I gave them a, right. good, a good workout. Well, um, if they come in, that's fine, but uh, let's get started. Um, uh, uh, let me start by introducing Sarah Handley Cousins, who's a, a Wells class of uh, 07. Uh, sin, disability, and gender in the Civil War era. And she is the executive editor of the digital history publication, Nursing Clio, and a, produce, and a producer of Dig, a history podcast. And a uh, fun fact, she was a member of Henry's Eight. Uh, in, yeah. in this short presentation, Sarah will talk about the history of women in Western medicine, from subjects of medical experimentation to practitioners in their own right. And we hope you'll join us again next month uh, when, on Wednesday, November 9th, when Tiffany Raymond, Wells Class of 10, and director of the Lewis Jefferson Long Library, explores some of the college archive's most interesting items and discusses projects that she's currently working on. I'd also like to read the Cayuga Land Acknowledgement, which has been approved by the Wells faculty. And that is that Wells College recognizes our collective responsibility to acknowledge our history. And the, this land that is in Aurora is the traditional land of the Cayuga Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And the college commits itself to ensuring the traditions and culture of indigenous peoples are reflected upon in solidarity with the Cayuga Nation. So with that introduction, Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you and looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much. I'm really interested in that talk that you mentioned about the, the Wells College archives. I, I spent a semester as a intern in the archives and it was really fascinating the things that I was finding up there. So um, hello everybody. Um, make sure that I can advance this slide. There we go. Um, my name is Sarah Hanley Cousins. Um, as Randy said, um, class of 2007. Um, I was a former director of Henry's Eight, uh, my one claim to fame in my time at Wells. Um, as for all of us, just a hugely, hugely transformative period in my life. Mm -hmm. And in no small part, why I um, have spent so much of my career as a historian looking at issues of gender um, in, in history. So um, a little bit about me. I teach the history of medicine, history of disability, history of war, history of the military at the University of Buffalo. I teach a little bit of everything. Um, I'm also the executive editor um, of a blog called Nursing Cleo, which is specifically about gender. And we sort of revolve around issues of gender and medicine um, in history as well as in contemporary issues. And I'm a producer and a founder of a podcast called Dig, a history podcast. And um, I don't have um, uh, links to any of those things here, but you can find any of them very easily with a Google search. And I'm not just saying that for self-promotion. I'm saying that because a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, I have to breeze through very quickly. And they're topics that deserve so much more investigation and, and um, you know, especially if you're interested, you know, you can do all sorts of reading and listening on these topics. And if you go to either Dig or Nursing Cleo, you will find lots and lots of material on these subjects. So what I'm going to do today is take you on sort of a whirlwind tour of women and medicine sort of 
from starting in, in ancient Greece and coming up sort of to today, obviously leaving an enormous amount of stuff out. Um, so let's start um, in Greece with the ancient Greeks. And we started there mostly because the Greeks are the, the philosophers and the thinkers and the doctors, the early doctors who are really formulating the way that Western medicine is going to be um, organized and the way people are gonna think about bodies for the next many centuries, right? So really a lot of things that are happening even in the early 20th century can be traced back to the ancient Greeks. Um, and of course the Greeks were not all entirely original. A lot of their ideas come from other thinkers and um, the Middle East and in Egypt and places like that as well. They were um, just particularly good at writing things down and leaving a legacy. So um, you might have noticed that the first slide, I called it women and medicine, not women in medicine. And that's because I'm gonna concentrate on a couple of different things. Women's bodies, theories about women's bodies, how doctors and medical practitioners thought about women's bodies, and also women as practitioners themselves. So we're going to be covering sort of both those things. So the ancient Greeks believed that male and female bodies were fundamentally different, right? And that women's bodies, of course, were biologically inferior to men's. Um, the Greeks believed that uh, male bodies were the ideal of beauty. If you've ever seen any sort of Greek statuary or, or Greek art, you know that the male form was something that the ancient Greeks were really sort of obsessed with, even to the point of creating sort of male physiques that can't exist in real life. Um, you know, something that you might see in a, a Marvel movie, for instance, right? Um, or The Rock, right? Imagine male bodies like that were really venerated. And they believed um, that the male form um, could be perfected in a way that sort of reflected the way that the power and the authority that men had in society. And they believed that the, that was a naturally occurring thing, right? That that wasn't something that they had created. It wasn't a system that was socially created, right? It was what, something that had been sort of inherent to men and to men's bodies. They believed this was a matter of divinity and biology rather than human decision making. Um, and sort of just saying, well, that's the way that it is, right? That's the way that um, we that, that humans were made. And so this kind of allowed them to not have to grapple with the fact that humans actively made those decisions, right? That to have men in positions of power and to keep women out of power. So if men's bodies were perfect and ideal, what were women's bodies? Um, women's bodies were essentially understood as a deviation from the norm, right? Men's bodies were the norm and women's bodies were a deviation from that. They were not normal. They were sort of inherently abnormal. They were inferior versions of male bodies. The Roman physician Galen writes this about the difference between men and women's bodies. For women are similar to men to the extent that they are to rational animals, that is, capable of acquiring knowledge. But to the extent that the genus of men is stronger and superior in every activity and learning, and women are weaker and inferior, in this they are unlike. Um, so how did they see this reflected in the physical form of, of people? Aristotle, not a doctor, but a philosopher, obviously a very, very influential philosopher, um, had some theories about how women's bodies were different. He believed that men's skulls had three sutures where the bones came together and that women only had one suture in their skull, which created sort of like a circular seam on the top of their skull. Um, and he theorized that this was because men's brains are larger and they need more ventilation. And so it takes them longer for the skull to close. This is not true, by the way. It, it is not accurate at all. Um, Aristotle also believed that men had more teeth than women, um, which apparently also proved that they were superior. More teeth meant more power to chew, indicating men would live longer lives. This is also not true, right? Men do not have more um, 
teeth than women. Um, scholars today, as a side note, think that he may have gotten this idea because women tended to lose their teeth at a faster rate, perhaps, in ancient Greece because of the, the difficulty, the iron deficiencies, and the hard work that women's bodies went through in childbearing and gestating, which I think is interesting. So the, um, the center of theories about women's bodies, the thing that it always sort of came down to was that the, the, the uterus was what set the woman's body apart from men's bodies. Thank you. Uh, All right, is there any more? Let me go in the background. I'm just having a hard time um, getting this mute. Um, Could you, yeah, put stuff if, everyone can just, if everyone can just mute your um, things, thank you. Sorry, I had a hard time uh, doing it on my end. Okay, thank That's you. That's totally fine. Um, so I, I was saying, in case you couldn't hear, um, what it comes down to really, um, these theories about the skull and the and teeth and everything, these are kind of extraneous ideas, but what it really comes down to is theories about the uterus. As you can see, both of these image, images before you are depicting uteruses. The one um, that's on my left may not look like a uterus to you, but that is how um, for a long time the uterus was understood. This comes from the, the drawings of a doctor named Vesalius, who was not an ancient Greek. He was actually Italian, lived many centuries later, but he's um, creating the imagery to try to depict what the Greeks are talking about. Um, and you might notice in that image that it looks an awful lot like male genitalia rather than women's genitalia. And that's because that was the framework that they understood women's bodies through, if that, if that makes sense. So um, the uterus is really where the ancient Greeks kind of focus their attention. Um, the, they um, really sort of the, the um, earliest ideas go back to Plato, the, another Greek philosopher who conceived of sex and sexual desire as sort of irrational acts, irrational desires that made humans kind of act irrationally and crazy, right? And he sort of chalks this up to the idea that the genitalia themselves, which he understands as the penis and the womb, um, he sees them as actually animate creatures in their own right. They're sort of separate entities. Um, and the uterus in particular is driven by a mad desire to be pregnant all the time. And that when it's not pregnant all the time, it makes it essentially go crazy. Um, and when it becomes crazy, it um, can make a woman very, very ill. He writes, uh, this, this is from his, um, his essay, Timaeus. And in women, again, owing to the same causes, this desire to be pregnant, Whenever the matrix or womb, as it is called, which is an indwelling creature desirous of childbearing, remains without fruit, being a child, long before the due season, it is vexed and it takes ill. And by straying all ways through the body, blocking up passages of the breath and preventing respiration, it casts the body into the uttermost distress and causes, moreover, all kinds of maladies until the desire and the love of the two sexes reunite them. So essentially the uterus or the womb as they called it, if it's not pregnant, it can wander all around your body and cause problems. And so this is sort of the ultimate example to the Greeks of how women themselves are irrational, right? Look at how irrational their bodies are. Uh, the only way for them to be healthy and be fit and be you know functioning as human beings is if they are kept in a constant state of pregnancy or almost pregnancy right until they can no longer have children so where did they get this idea right i mean we have to know first of all that they're not um autopsies are not happening right they're not doing dissections there was um sort of a taboo against dissection. And so the Greeks are not opening up people's bodies and looking and trying to find wandering wombs, right? But at the same time, people butchered animals 
and you know they know that the womb the, the the uterus is like anchored to stuff it doesn't just kind of float around willy-nilly so we don't really know where this came from this idea um for the most part the greeks believed that uteruses could be fine as long as they were kept anchored by pregnancies or if they were and i'm not i promise i'm not making this up i see rachel laughing at me um the other option was if they were kept moist from having regular sexual intercourse. I know it's, it is, it's completely ridiculous. Um, and so if your womb was to get kind of loose and float around your body, this created that condition was called hysteria, right? Hist being sort of the root for, for womb. Um, and so who were the people who were most at risk for becoming hysterical it was young women, widows and old women right why was that Th those were the people who were the least likely to be having regular intercourse and to be getting pregnant um if a woman's womb was wandering about how could you get it to come back right how could you get it to settle down and chill out um one greek physician Eratias, uh says if the uterus delights in excuse me it the uterus delights in fragrant smells and advances towards them. So you could just like put something that smells very nice near the vaginal opening and the uterus would come back. Um, and uh, it's important to note, not all Greek physicians agreed with this. Some people thought that this was really crazy. There's a physician named Sorinus that, that writes, it does not issue forth like a wild animal from the lair, just delighted by fragrant odors and fleeing away from bad odors, right? So there is some disagreement here. Um, but the reason I bring this up, other than the fact that it's hilarious, is that it, it shows just the complete lack of knowledge about women's bodies and how they worked, right? To the Greeks, and then to people going forward, particularly to men who were in, held the positions of power in medicine, women's bodies are just seen as mysterious and baffling. Um, so I mentioned before that hysteria cre um, was believed to create um like a suffocating sensation right as the uterus sort of floated upward in the body and the symptoms if you look at um documents from the from um ancient greece going through um the next several centuries even into the 19th century the symptoms that they're describing are things like heart palpitations trouble breathing a feeling of suffocation and when we think about that now it might sound a little bit like a panic attack, right? It might sound a little bit like a woman who is having anxiety. Um, and of course it's not a one-to-one, -one, but it is something really interesting that like the, the symptoms, what, what might have been physical manifestations of psychological ailments were chalked up to women's inability or refusal to play their part in society, get pregnant and have babies. Um, I want to say sort of one, um, oh, before I move on. So obviously hysteria is a Greek thing, right? Ancient Greeks, um, physicians are the ones who are first articulating this, but the ideas have a lot of sticking power. So let's see. Um, so for one thing, just to kind of skip forward to a really modern way that hysteria has be, been um, sort of, I don't, I don't want to say in the news, but has been sort of present in our own lives. Um, in 1999, a historian named Rachel Maines wrote um, a article called The Technology of Orgasm about the history of vibrators. And she makes this argument that vibrators were invented by doctors to treat hysteria. And that um, you would go into the doctor's office and your physician would use a kind of an old timey giant vibrator on you to bring around what he called a paroxysm, what they called paroxysms, which would then help cure your hysteria. Um, and if you, if you, I guarantee that almost all of you at some point on social media or somewhere have seen this idea floated around. It was really common in memes uh, several years ago. Um, and it still pops up this idea that like vibrators were invented by doctors. Um, it is not 
accurate. As much as it's a fantastic story, it is not true. Um, there were lots of vibrating devices. And in fact, some of them were intended for genitalia, but they were actually intended for men. And they were intended largely for um, erectile dysfunction, that uh, sort of a feeling of a sense of loss of masculinity. Um, and so there were various different kinds of vibrating devices. There was an idea that electrical vibration could like get your, your body sort of back in order and give you energy back, but it wasn't used sexually. This, this um, would, would have been absolutely a taboo um, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, as much as it would be a taboo today, right? The other way that ideas about women's bodies and hysteria became really common um, or really present for us, I think, is uh, was in the, the final weeks of the 2016 presidential election, um, when there was just constant a barrage of stories in tabloids about Hillary Clinton's old aging body and how she was, you know, her, um, she was having all sorts of health problems. There's um, sort of doctored photographs of her with yellow skin and bags under her eyes and how she was essentially dying and all these different things um, that kind of come back to those really old ideas about women's bodies and what happens to women's bodies when they are no longer fertile, right? Um, one final thing about hysteria that I bring up because many of us attended Wells when it was a, a women's institution, um, the really old ideas about hysteria, even though, um, doctors may not have been calling it hysteria anymore. And even though, um, medicine had advanced significantly over the many, many, many centuries, those ideas about hysteria still continued to affect decision making well into the 20th century, or excuse me, well into the 19th century. Um, and one way that, that it had a real impact in a way that we are all familiar with was on women in education. And the idea was that people's bodies, women's bodies in particular, only have a finite amount of energy. They only have a finite amount of blood. And that if women are going to college, if they're going to school and they're thinking a lot and they're reading a lot, it is essentially stealing the energy and the blood flow from their reproductive organs and redirecting it to their brain. And there was a concern that that was unhealthy for young women, but the concern really was what effect will that have on their future children? right? If it's sapping that energy from their womb and they're using their fertile, most fertile years, you know, sitting in, in long library <laughs> reading or, or something like that, um, what is that doing to their potential future children when they get a womb that is sort of defective because of that, right? So it kicks off um, a, a fight, not among people who were sort of, um, in the education world, but among doctors. And you can see the two rival publications here. Um, the initial one, or excuse me, the, I think the, um, yeah, the initial one that is about education is the one on the right, which is by Edward Clark, which is a fair chance for girls, right? In which he's arguing that like women have to be really careful when it comes to education and they need to sort of stop going to school at a certain time and, and all of this. Um, this isn't the, um, the book that she writes in argument with Clark. It's an, in, in another example of her writing, but Mary Putnam Jacoby, who we're going to talk about later on, um, really kick-ass uh, woman doctor, uh, writes an, an essay back to Clark and is like, this is just complete anti-science nonsense. Um, uh, but it, you know, it is still affecting women for many centuries after these Greeks um, are long deceased. So, okay, moving on, no more uteruses, at least for a little while, I promise. All right, so, um, so far we've sort of mostly talked about um, women's bodies, ideas and assumptions about women's bodies, um, but, 
it's important to know also that women have also always been medical practitioners, just often not in ways that the sort of official organized ranks of medicine recognized, right? Women, uh, for the part, could not get medical educations. Um, and there were a couple of women who became sort of um, well known for their role in medicine, but it was in sort of an, an unofficial capacity, right? So for instance, there's a, a Turkish princess named Anna Komnena um, who lives in Constantinople and um, she's born in the year 1053. Because she's very wealthy, she's, a, she's royalty, right? She's able to kind of use her special place in society to kind of bend the rules about what's acceptable for women. And so one of the things that she does is start to read. Her family, again, being royalty, has access to books, which is not particularly common for most folks in, the, in you know, the, in 1053, right? Um, so she is reading extensively in the works of Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, Galen, um, those philosophers and Greek and Roman doctors. And so she becomes well known in the city for her healing abilities. Um, her father was sick on and off and she actually gains sort of a reputation for being a really skilled nurse, not just in her care work, but also in her knowledge of medicine so that she actually kind of works alongside her, um, her father's doctors in providing him care. And we know, the only reason that we know anything about Anna Komnena is because she writes a massive history about her father's time as king. Um, and in that she writes a lot about her father's health, which kind of as a necessity requires that she sort of talk about her role in helping to manage his health. So it's a really unusual thing that not only she did all of that, but also that we have a record of it, right? Um, and there are a couple other examples. I'm not going to go into detail about them. Women like Rebecca Guarna, who lives around the year 1200, um, who sort of um, innovates using uh, like essentially what we today call urinalysis. A woman in the 1300s named Mercuriad, who actually goes to university and studies medicine in a formal way and writes treatises on infectious diseases. But for the most part, um, women who practiced medicine were doing it in sort of an informal capacity. If they were able to access sort of the formal ranks of medicine, it was because they were uh, outliers, right? They were very, very wealthy. They had some kind of access that would allow them to bend the rules, but those were vanishingly, vanishingly rare. Um, but at the same time, while men are dominating sort of the official ranks of medicine, it's women who are doing most of the day-to-day -day medical care that's happening, right? So think about it for a second. Like when you were a little kid and you like scraped your knee or you had a cold, you know, more likely than not, or if you are right now a mom, right? You are familiar with your kids coming to you and, and saying like, I, like my kid today walking home, fell down, bent her arm at a weird angle. I had to go like get some frozen corn and put it on it, right? Um, so it was really women who were doing that sort of day-to-day -day care. This is why um, in the 19th century, the famous nurse Florence Nightingale says, every woman is a nurse, right? Sort of calling on that sort of um, knowledge that women got passed down from family members and from neighbors and from women's networks how you cared for various different ailments because you wouldn't be able to go to the doctor. And if you called the doctor, what he was gonna offer you was probably gonna be more unpleasant than mom's sort of homemade tinctures and tonics. So this kind of knowledge was often things like how to grow medicinal herbs. A lot of women grew medical gardens, um, what herbs to use in what particular amounts for ailments, how to make medicines out of those herbs. Um, but the largest single thing that women did that was um, medical work was as midwives. Midwives 
trained in informal ways. They did not go to a school, right? They didn't get a, a degree in midwifery like you would today. They usually apprenticed with an older woman or a relative. This is why a lot of times midwifery was a family job. It went from mom to daughter to daughter to daughter, right? Um, and it was not a full-time job. It was often practiced um, sort of around all of the jobs that were expected of you as a woman and as a, a female member of your family, right? So around the cooking, the cleaning, the sewing, making fabric, all of that stuff still had to be done. And you also had this other skill set that you might use. So one really famous example, and if anyone's a, a big reader or likes to read histories, I cannot recommend this book enough. It's one of my favorite history texts. Um, it's called A Midwife's Tale. And it's um, based on the diary of a woman named Martha Ballard. And it's an incredible diary. Um, she lived um, sort of around the time of the American Revolution. She lived in what is now Maine. So a very rural area um, at that time. And um, Martha Ballard just is sort of a really illustrative of what midwives' lives were like, what their educations were like. Um, she had a very limited formal education. We don't know exactly uh, who taught her how to be a midwife, probably a female relative or um, someone in her community. And we know a lot about how she practiced and what she did on a day-to-day -day basis because she keeps it all written down um, in detail in her really incredible diary. She kept a medical herb garden at her home. She brewed um, medications. She made ointments and syrups and pills and teas to be administered as medicines. Um, not only did she deliver babies, she also did what we might think of today as kind of hospice work and sitting with families as a family member was dying, helping to prepare the body for burial. Um, if there was an outbreak of sickness, she was the first line of defense, right? We're talking about a really small rural community where the doctor might be in the next town and he's, you know, several hours ride away. So Martha Ballard was doing sort of all of the medical work um, for that town. Um, for a long time, historians believed that midwives were often accused of witchcraft. And you might have this idea, you may have heard this too, right? This association between midwifery um, or women involved in medicine in some way and accusations of witchcraft. And I think it comes back to sort of this, um, the idea of women having knowledge that they weren't supposed to have, right? Knowledge that was supposed to be for men. Also, sort of the um, fact that midwives were often present when things went wrong, right? When a, when a delivery went wrong and a baby died or a woman was injured or became very ill, right? Um, so it, it makes a certain amount of sense. And there were some theories, if we go um, back to, um, I believe it's written in the 16th century, that famous text called the Hammer of Witches, Malleus Maleficarum, also really fun reading if you want <laughs> some like angry German dudes um, for your reading. Uh, so the, two guys named Springer and Kramer. And they have like one sentence or two about midwives saying that no one, they say, quote, no one does more harm to the Catholic faith than midwives. For when they do not kill children, then as if for some other purpose, they take them out of the room and raise them up in the air and they offer them over to devils. And so this couple of sentences really could sort of set in motion this idea that midwives were often accused of witchcraft. Um, but what's, um, while that's really compelling and interesting to think about, and it works really well today for people to be able to kind of point to like, oh, look at the way that women healers have been oppressed and women's um, ways of, of caring for one another have been oppressed. It's unfortunately also not true. I'm just like busting myths here. Um, there really is no evidence that midwives were disproportionately um, accused of witchcraft. In fact, midwives were often brought in as witnesses um, for the prosecution against women who were accused of, of witchcraft, right? They were often used to um, 
inspect the bodies of women um, that so that then that the you know if they had something like a mark on their body which could be considered like the devil's teat right with, with um midwives were the ones that were doing that kind of work so they actually kind of the complete opposite of being accused so what's my next slide oh, okay i'm not gonna let you look at her yet you can look at her soon i promise um one last thing about midwives. Midwives start to be pushed out of the profession starting in the late 18th century. So that by the time you get into the late 19th century, it, it would be much more unusual for you to be attended at your birth by a midwife. Um, you know, if you think about Today, it's much more common for someone to have a midwife present at their birth. A lot of hospitals even have midwives on staff in their OBGYN wards. Um, but for a long time, midwives were simply not present except in places that didn't have access to other um, kinds of medicine. And that didn't happen on accident. Um, they were, midwives were actually pushed out of the medical profession starting in the late 18th century by um, a new crop of medical doctors, male medical doctors, who were starting to graduate from medical schools with MDs as the, the, the profession is beginning to um, formalize. And they're kind of looking around them, trying to find their place, they find their place in the profession, right? And they see what they think of as a, a, a uh, a big part of the marketplace, a big part of the medical marketplace is being sort of dominated by untrained women who don't have the latest, um, uh, the latest knowledge of antisepsis and things like that, right? They don't, they're just kind of brewing medications in their kitchens. This is inappropriate. And so male physicians start to kind of take over um, what we would today now think of obstetrics and gynecology, right? And that um, as a field of medicine starts to develop around that time period, as male doctors start to um, start to focus on that as um, their area of expertise. And part of the reason that this works isn't just patriarchy, even though that is a significant part of it, right? Um, it's also because the male doctors can offer something to women in labor that midwives just can't. In fact, they can offer three things. I mean, one, one thing they can offer is just their expertise, right? They can offer the fact that they have a knowledge of the anatomy because of their training in, in dissection and, and things like that, because of their vast medical training in order to get their MD, right? But more importantly, they can offer pain relief, especially starting in the 19th century. They have access to laudanum, which is essentially morphine soaked in alcohol. Like, and that is, you know, if you're in labor and there's nothing else, laudanum is great. I'm sure. Um, I can't speak from experience. I have not had laudanum. Um, but I'm sure when there's nothing else but like the witch hazel tea or something that the midwife is offering you, laudanum probably looks like a really good option. Um, and then starting in the mid 19th century, doctors can offer chloroform, which will actually put you sort of under in a way, not as effectively, of course, as modern um, uh, medications, but chloroform um, relaxes you and sort of puts you out in a way that allows it to take place without you having to really have a recollection or a knowledge of what's going on. And today it's really common to hear, um, you know, activists around birth, um, to, to talk about that in extremely negative terms. And I understand why that is. It has a lot to do with the 1950s and, and how things like twilight sleep were used. Um, which is, you know, I wish we had time to get, that's a whole, you know, different, um, whole nother ball of wax. Um, but we also have to put ourselves in the mindset of women of the late 18th century and of the 19th century who are facing repeated pregnancies, right? Um, often one right on top of another, on top of another. And just because a, a birth is 
quote unquote natural doesn't mean that it's pleasant, right? Um, and so for a lot of women, like take for instance, um, Queen Victoria, she actually requests chloroform. And I wanna say it's for her fourth or fifth baby. Um, she's like, please try chloroform. And to the, to the point where the doctors are actually sort of like, we can't because if this goes wrong, we've killed the queen of England, right? Like we do not want that on our hands, but it's, it's incredibly, um, you know, uh, women really want access to that. The other thing that the, the physicians can offer is forceps. And again, as much as forceps today are a symbol of sort of obstetrical um, uh, oppression in a way, they also were a tool that could save lives in the 18th and 19th century. Those were things that midwives did not use and often could not use, were kept from using. Those were um, tools that uh, um, obstetricians kept for themselves. And so um, because of all of these things and because of the fact that women are being kept out of formal medical education, with, uh, midwives are, are sort of cast as uh, backward, untrained, not having high standards of cleanliness, and they're pushed out of the profession. And so women really kind of um, don't have a formal role in medicine until about the mid 19th century. That's not to say that there weren't any exceptions and that midwives disappeared from the face of the earth. That's not true at all. It's just that men sort of started to take over that that um, position. So in the mid 19th century, this starts to change uh, with women like um, the woman that you're seeing in front of you, who is Elizabeth Blackwell. Elizabeth Blackwell is the first woman to earn a MD in the United States, and she does it in the Finger Lakes, right? She goes to the Geneva Medical College, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and Elizabeth Blackwell is, is really interesting, not just because she's the first um, woman, but because she has a particular idea about how women, the, the role that women physicians should play in medicine. She studies medicine in the same way that a man would. She gets a, you know, what we would, I guess, consider a traditional MD, right? As much as you can do that in the 19th century, maybe a little less rigorous. Um, but she also travels to Europe, which is what most male physicians did to get sort of their um, hands-on training with the best of the best. They would often go to Europe and get that training. She does that. Um, then she goes to, um, she's, she, I think she's in Scotland for a period, which is where some of the best medical schools were at the University of Edinburgh. She goes to France to train as an OBGYN. She comes back to New York City and she opens up her own um, her own infirmary called the Infirmary for Women and Children. And that right there is an important part of this, right? Her, her practice is for women and children. She saw women's role in medicine, not as being equal to or the same as men's role. She saw it as being unique, right? That women had unique roles, unique traits, and that they should bring that to medicine. She's actually motivated to become a doctor partly because the women who by the, by the mid to the end of the 19th century who are cornering the medical market, who are, maybe I shouldn't say cornering the medical market, who are the people known as women physicians, right? They're, they are the women who are working in medicine, are people like, I'm going to come back to that in one second, Madame Ristel. Madame Ristel was um, essentially an abortionist. Um, and most of the women who were practicing a kind of medical trade in the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, were abortion providers. The image here um, of Madame Ristel comes from the National Police Gazette, just sort of a, um, a tabloid of sort of true crime. And I'm sorry. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you. What? The <laughs> I'm 
I'm sorry. There are scratching noises coming from the garage and we might Dang all noises. die is Dang literally noises. a quote that I was just told. So, so Madame Ristel is, um, is an abortionist and, you know, there's a lot to be said about that. Um, I don't want to go too much over time, um, but suffice it to say, and I know you've had uh, someone else just recently gave a talk about sort of the history of abortion access. Um, but, you know, abortion was not illegal in the United States um, during the 19th century until the AMA, the American Medical Association, starts to crack down on it, not because they are opposed to abortion, but because they are opposed to the fact that it is largely women who are performing it without medical licenses. So doctors themselves continue to perform abortions, um, but they do so in their own offices. They want to get people like Madame Ristel out of the trade. And Elizabeth Blackwell feels sort of the same way. She thinks that women should be in medicine as reformers, that they should bring their own sort of sympathetic, um, empathetic traits and qualities to medicine and, and sort of um, be more, um, to, to bring a softer touch to medicine, if that makes sense. She saw uh, women as, as being able to have a moralizing influence on the medical profession and on the world in general. Now, Mary Putnam Jacoby, who we talked about just briefly um, before, um, is, an, is another woman, his, um, another woman physician of the 19th century who ends up sort of creating um, a dichotomy with Elizabeth Blackwell that's really, I think, informative about how women, the, the places that women occupied in medicine in the 19th century. Elizabeth Blackwell, again, understands women's roles as being different from men, right? She wants to be this moralizing influence. Mary Putnam Jacoby has a very similar story to um, Elizabeth Blackwell. She's a little younger. She actually does study privately with Elizabeth Blackwell in New York City for a short period. Then she goes to the Female Medical College of Pennsylvania, a single sex medical school that's now um, been sort of absorbed by Drexel University, which is kind of cool. It's still sort of part of the Drexel um, University. Um, and again, like Elizabeth Blackwell, she goes to Europe and she studies in you know, learns the trade from the, the really um, skilled doctors there, the kind of cutting edge science. And she comes back with a very different perspective than Elizabeth Blackwell. She comes back and thinks women have to take up space in the profession as experts and scientists in their own right. We can't keep saying that women are different. We have to say that women are the same. Right, we have to demand that women see it, or that the the, the profession sees us as the same. Um, and they have, as you can probably imagine, a pretty contentious relationship. There aren't a lot of women in medicine, and so they are, you know, they can't avoid each other, um, and they disagree on pretty much everything. And they write each other kind of like catty letters back and forth, kind of arguing about this sort of stuff. But it's interesting; it sort of sets up the difference in how women physicians appear in the late 19th century. Um, and increasingly towards the turn of the century, there are more and more women in medicine. I'll finish up here by just saying a couple last things. Um, so I don't think it would be right to have a, a talk on women and medicine um, without acknowledging that there are some really complicated legacies in this world, right? One of the, well, let's say two of the most powerful, important standout figures of medicine, especially as it pertains to women, are Florence Nightingale, you see on the left, and Margaret Sanger up on the top. Um, Florence Nightingale, is very much still held up as the founder of the nursing profession. And she is hugely influential, right? Um, 
especially um, you know, she kind of helps to um, create a role for women in the nursing profession, which wasn't really a profession and also wasn't really open to women, right? Um, and she does that during the Crimean War in the 1850s by sort of, um, sort of um, in a way trying to be like a reformer and help clean up hospitals and, and act as kind of a, um, uh, an assistant, someone who can come in and help. Um, and then sort of being thrust into a more medical role and then kind of claiming that role for women. At the same time, Florence Nightingale was transparently racist. Um, and as unfortunately, a lot of women in her position as a pretty wealthy white woman from England at the time uh, were, right? And so the fact that she is still held up as, you know, the, the, the founder of the nursing profession and is a lot of those sort of more negative aspects of her legacy are kind of swept under the rug is really problematic. I'll tell you really briefly, um, a couple years ago, um, the, the website that I work for, Nursing Clio, ran a series on the history of nursing and it was hugely popular. Um, and we published one essay called um, The Racist Lady with the Lamp because that's, was, that's Florence Nightingale's nickname, the, the Lady with the Lamp. Um, and we published this essay called The Racist Lady with the Lamp and nursing historians, oh, traditionalist nursing historians went absolutely crazy and emailed each of us individually. We're so angered and offended by this essay. And, and it was, um, all the essay was doing was pointing to Nightingale's own writings. So um, a complicated legacy there. Um, and we may, we're probably all more familiar with the legacy of Margaret Sanger, who of course is, is hugely influential in pioneering birth control access um, in the United States and advocating for women's reproductive freedom um, and also being a eugenicist. Uh, I, I think in a way that is a little different from Florence Nightingale's sort of complicated legacy, Mar <laughs> Margaret Sanger was not, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Margaret Sanger was also a person who was of her time, right? Also a white woman of her time period and a white woman who's very involved in progressive politics and progressives believed strongly in the science of eugenics, right? It was a, a, a progressive science. And so she believed essentially um, that birth control access, limiting the, the reproduction of certain groups could help those groups uh, particularly Black Americans, could help them to better themselves, right? To better the race. Not good, <laughs> just blatantly not good, right? She also gave a talk, at least one talk, it may have been more than one, to the KKK in the 1920s. Not great, right? She was someone who was so zealously sort of focused on spreading her message to whoever would listen that she didn't think critically about who the audience was that was inviting her to talk. So again, both women really complicated, flawed figures and also both really important figures in the history of medicine um, that I think that we, we need to continue to grapple with. Um, so sort of finally here, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, the medical profession has a, an oversupply problem. There are too many people graduating from medical schools. And the problem they decide, the American Medical Association, Association decides, the problem is that there are so many medical schools that are essentially unaccredited. Just anybody, anybody can open a medical school and call it a medical school. So you have people graduating with MDs who have never looked inside a human body, who have never taken chemistry classes, who failed the majority of their exams and classes. 
um, people who went to schools that taught primarily homeopathy um, or other kinds of medical, excuse me, like other kinds of medical theories, right? Not, not actual um, medical practices. And so they have this guy, Abraham Flexner, come in and, um, and do essentially an, an educational audit of medical education and determine sort of what the situation is. And Flexner publishes what becomes known as the Flexner Report in 1910. Um, and it um, sort of give, it lays out sort of the, the, the state of medical education. And the result of it is a huge number of medical schools are forced to close. The AMA kind of um, says that they can no longer grant MDs and they are forced to close. The reason that I'm telling you this is because a lot of those smaller schools that were essentially underfunded were schools that graduated disproportionately women and people of color. And so the result of the Flexner Report is twofold. One, the quality of medical education goes up, the standards go up, right? We have a lot better training for doctors, but we also have a huge decrease in the women and people of color who are able to graduate with MDs. And I just pulled a couple of these um, statistics from, um, I think it's like the American Academy of Women in Medicine or something, it's some, some organization um, that shows that it is just in 2019 that women surpassed 50% of, of students in, um, in medical schools. And then I think this is really interesting. These, these um, slides here show sort of where the gender breakdown is in the medical field, right? Men dominate orthopedic surgery, neurological surgery, radiology, thoracic surgery, pain medicine, and radiology. I think it's really important to point out that those are all specialties that are extremely lucrative, right? That where, where you can make a lot of money. Where do women end up disproportionately? Obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics. I think that the, that is really interesting, right? That that's, that there is still that divide. And it makes me think personally, I'm not a doctor. I've never gone through medical school. So I, you know, I can't speak from experience. But it makes me think back to the divide between Elizabeth Blackwell and Mary Putnam Jacoby, right? Over where, what women's role is in medicine. So with that, I will end. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I can try to talk in more depth about anything if you are curious about it. Thank you so much for listening to me and for being patient with my child and her. Um, fear of apparently the monster in the garage that was coming for her. Well, thanks, Sarah. That was very interesting. Um, uh, I uh, will welcome questions, but I, um, I'll i just note that uh, I've been, uh, since I retired last year, I've decided to get uh, into my family uh, history and genealogy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I learned that my seven times great grandmother, uh, Christina Stein, who uh, came, uh, was born in 1684 and came to Pennsylvania in 1729, was a midwife who uh, was, the Moravians uh, recorded that she delivered over 300 children during her wow. uh, lifetime. Uh, That's so, incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been in the uh, 1700. She died in uh, 1773. Wow. So that's yeah, really um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, I don't know if she passed that to any of her daughters. Um, I don't know. Uh, I know she had three sons that survived her. Uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure if she had any surviving daughters uh, uh, late in life. So, but just an aside. Though. Yeah, no, that's, that's really fascinating.